Um, this time, I will talk about the different styles in architectural design. Um, I believe I said earlier that in architectural design, um, you can use um, different styles of architectural design. Also, it has a common components from the other styles. So basically, it has its oh, uh, it has commonalities from one style to other styles. Okay, so what are these architectural styles? So I believe you can see it here on my screen. I already shared um, the data-centered architecture. So one architecture is what we call data-centered. This type of architecture, it's actually um, the data store um, resides at the center um, of the architecture, or for example, at the center of the universe, <laughs> like a sun. And several um, software components access the data. So we have eight components all in all. So I will just need to check on these components. One moment. Okay, we have eight components who actually um, access um, the data store. Um, this also, or this type of architecture, the data is decoupled by um, from software components and exhibits a form of persistency or um, consistency okay meaning um, the data store component is naturally stable and that changes to the structure of data is limited or rare okay the software component on the other hand can be varied um, some of the um, some of the software can be stable others are not okay so meaning the components can be changed so that um, when I say components can be changed um, you can remove you can add new components um, without concerning um, about other components okay also in data centered architecture the data is centralized and accessed frequently by other components so the communication is only from the component going to the data store not from the component going to the other component okay so the main purpose of this style is to achieve data integrity or what we called um, integ integrality of data okay data centered architecture consists of different components that communicate through shared data repositories so we have um, data store here that contains repository or what we call blackboard um, the components access a shared data st um, structure and are relatively um, independent in that they interact only through the data store. Just like what I explained earlier, there is no communication from, um, um, there will be no communication from, there will be no direct communication from component to the other component because it will need to have a communication from the component going to the data store so the communication is not between the components or subsystems but between the data store and also the components okay there we go next um, a variation of this architecture is what we call a blackboard architecture okay in blackboard um, the data repository um, actually sits in the heart of the architecture but this central component is active and passive I believe that I all showed here earlier that in the data store you can see here the repository or the blackboard this is the part where I will explain this okay so um, again um, the central component it's active and not passive okay take note on that one note that in the repository approach earlier the data store is passive okay the data store earlier here it's passive but here the data store it's active okay and the components work to modify the data in the repository in this case um, the data store is active and the software components rely on the communications made by the data store whenever it is updated so basically it depends on the blackboard or it depends on this um, active um, component okay 
So central to this kind of architecture is the Blackboard system. So Blackboard controls the messages that needs to be sent to the other software components. So, um, so again, um, this is the central um, component that will communicate from one component to the other components. Okay. So in Blackboard architectures, a central Blackboard, which is this one, um, um, Blackboard data structure holds the entire state of the solution. So we have, we also have domain and the world, uh, world knowledge here, the knowledge source. It, this is actually represented in separated independent knowledge sources or the KS which hold computation that respond to changes in the BB or in the blackboard okay so by again the blackboard operates the knowledge source okay don't forget about that and um, uh, which it holds computation again the KS or the knowledge source um, holds the computation that respond to changes in the blackboard and with direct access to it also it interacts through the blackboard to yield solutions okay we also have control here for the control it monitors um, changes in the blackboard and determines the next action to be executed okay it also plans the evaluations and activations according to a strategy that decides which knowledge source is the one that will uh, that will next change the blackboard so this is actually useful for AI or artificial intelligence systems and the like uh, also we can also consider this type of um, architecture like our CPU uh, for CPU we have what we call um, um, we, we actually we have ACU uh, that will um, um, that will hold the operation but let me double check that one uh, one moment mm, I need to check about that one one moment okay because we are talking about the central processing unit uh, we have what we called a um, ACU uh, the central processing unit basically here this is the blackboard or this is the central and it contains um, ALU or what we called arithmetic um, logic unit that will basically um, um, it um, performs arithmetic and logic operations and we also have the uh, what we call the um, we also have the no I forgot the name mm, yeah I really forgot the name but basically um, um, in CPU um, the central or the blackboard it's the CPU then the um, the knowledge source would be the ALU or the arithmetic logic um, logic unit and basically the control that will serve as the um, the other memories or the other components in the CPU okay okay so why is it called blackboard okay so the name of the pattern was chosen because it is uh, reminiscent of the situation in which human experts sit in front of the real blackboard and work together to solve a problem Okay, so basically, um, you can add components or clients to the Blackboard. So when we say uh, we can actually add other components here, so for example, we can add other components. It's really up to you. Or clients, you can add other clients here, such as the knowledge source and also the control. Um, we can also draw, uh, draw data or information from the Blackboard. So again, the blackboard, it's the active component, okay? It's the central component. So I will also need to ex uh, share to you guys um, the um, advantages of using um, blackboard. Uh, one is what we call, one, actually the blackboard provides um, scalability, which provides easy to add or update knowledge source. Two, 
Um, it provides concurrency that allows all knowledge source to work in parallel as they are independent of each other, right? Just like what I explained earlier. Third, um, it supports um, experiment, uh, experimentation for hypothesis. And lastly, it supports reusability of knowledge source agents. Okay, one of the most disadvantage, uh, one of the most uh, disadvantaged part of using the blackboard architecture is this one. So, mm, there will be major challenges in the part uh, in the designing and also in the testing of the system phases or in the part where we will test um, each component. Uh, it's actually, um, it's not disaster, but it really takes a lot of time and effort if you will use this type of architecture, okay? You will know more about that one if we will talk about testing. Okay, next we have data flow architecture. Um, this architecture is applied when input when input data are to be transformed through a series of computational or manipulative components into output data. So for example, here this is the input and here this is the output part. Okay, so this is often, uh, often called a pipe and filter pattern has a set of components. So this is a pipe where it uh, basically um, it contains a message. The filter, this is actually our components here. This is, uh, these are our components and it is called filter. Okay, so again, uh, when we say filter, it is a pattern that has a set of components. And if we will talk about pipes, it's actually the connection, okay? It basically, it transmits data from one component to the next. That's the purpose of the pipe, okay? Each filter works independently of those components upstream and downstream. So basically, it will work on its own without any interference from the other components, okay? And also, it is designed to expect data input of a certain form and produces a data output to the next filter of the specific of a specified form. However, the filter does not require knowledge of the workings of the neighboring filters. Again, just like what I said earlier, it will not interfere. This component or this filter will not interfere the other um, the other components, okay? So, walang pakialam, okay? That's what we call it. That's for the data flow architecture. Okay, so when to use the data flow architecture? First, uh, we can use that one um, if the process, if the processing required by an application can easily be broken down into set of independent steps, okay? Next, flexibility is required to allow reordering of the processing steps performed by an application or capability to add or remove the steps. Okay, since it will not interfere from one of, uh, from each uh, from one another, if you will remove or add uh, other steps or other filter, um, parang wala lang pong nangyari, like that. Okay, next, the system can benefit from distributing the processing for steps across different servers. Okay, and re reliable solution is required that minimizes the effects of failure in a step while data is being processed. Take note of these, um, um, take note of these uh, reminders when to use the data flow architecture. Okay. We also have the call and return architecture. So uh, this classic program structure decomposes function into a control hierarchy where a main program, which this one, invokes a number of program components, which, is, uh, which in turn may invoke still other components. So basically, um, by the word itself, call and return, it it, it's actually uh, it has its own 
subcomponents then each subcomponents created its its components as well like that one okay so this architectural style enables you to achieve a program a program structure that is relatively easy to modify and also to scale okay there are two types of um, um, call and return architecture I know that you can see it here right now uh, on, on my screen I presented the main program or the sub program um, architecture um, the main program structure decomposes into a number of sub programs this is the example basically we also have the remote procedure call this is also an architecture of a call and return um, the main program structure decomposes into a number of sub programs or function into a control hierarchy so the main program contains number of sub programs that can be invoked the other components okay and we also have what we called object oriented um, architecture so the components of a system encapsulates data and the operations that must be applied to manipulate the data so basically this um, this central component for example um, it's actually uh, it instantiated another um, object so the coordination and the communication between the comments uh, sorry the components are established via the message passing so we have the message passing here okay these are the message passing okay and we also have the layered architecture okay um, this is the last architecture um, in the um, in the architectural style so um, a number of different layers are defined you can see it here so we have four layers we have starting from the user interface going to the application going to the utility and going uh, the innermost is what we call core okay each accomplice uh, accomplishing operations that progressively become closer to the machine instruction set so basically it creates uh, it has its own components each layer has its own components okay at the outer layer components service um, component service for example in the user interface operations and at the inner layer um, the components perform operating system interfacing for example um, inter uh, intermediate layers provide utility services and the application functions for example okay a layered style uh, um, which is uh, will appropriate for most systems can be combined with a data centered architecture in many database applications um, the example I gave earlier which is the um, emergency response system actually follows the um, the layered uh, the layered architecture uh, I believe this one okay from the presentation going to the data layer but basically as long as it contains its own um, purpose I know that I only presented four layers here uh-huh so this is actually what we called a layer architecture 